handwriting on the wall for me that life, my life was never going to be easy from that day forward. So, okay, let me, let's just moving forward a little bit here. We got the, the question comes up then, how did they use the executive branch? If they hijacked it, how did they use it to achieve their objectives? And that, that's a fair question. I think that's the only question. Well, let's consider the position of the U.S. trade representative. <clears throat> this is the guy that negotiates all the treaties, the trade treaties for the government. Yes. And there, this position has been alive since I think 1974, maybe a little before that, but the position has been alive. And since 1976, there have been 12 appointees by the president to the USTR. In other words, there's been 12 different people who have been US trade representatives. These are the guys that negotiated all the trade treaties, literally, the NAFTA, CAFTA, um, the, the TPP that's being proposed right now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the Trans-Atlantic Partnership is coming up. All these treaties are negotiated by these people. They're the lead negotiators, hands down. 12 have been appointed since 1976. Nine of those, John, have been members of the Trilateral Commission. Nine. Another coincidence. Including the current USTR, Michael Froman, who's negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So looking back over the years, you've had people like Robert Strauss, Reuben Askew, William Brock from 81 to 85 under Reagan. You had Carla Hills under Bush uh, from 89 to 93, Mickey Cantor under Carter, Charlene Barshevsky under, uh, under Jimmy Carter, not under Carter, under Clinton. Robert Zellick came in under George Bush, Jr. Susan Schwab, Michael Froman, and the other three appointees that's not to say that they were, oh, well, they're not trilaterals. They must be good. They carried on the same policy, essentially. But 9 out of 12, for crying out loud, is just a little bit beyond coincidences, don't you think? Yes, far beyond it. This is, this is one of the reasons they needed to have control over the executive branch was to be able to appoint the USTR. Now, here's another stunning revelation. The president of the United States also has the... Uh, the protocol to appoint presidents of the World Bank. The International Monetary Fund head is appointed by Europeans. The World Bank for, I don't know when they set this up originally way back, this is the way it was and it's been this way ever since. So our president appoints the World Bank president. There's no vote on it uh, at all, but there have been eight World Bank presidents since 1960, well, actually, since 1968, um, <clears throat> six of the eight have been members of the Trilateral Commission. Six of the eight. The World Bank is the most important engine of globalization in the history of the world. Without the World Bank, there would be no globalization today. Patrick, where do they source these people? How do they qualify them? They qualify them by being team players. That's a good question. This is not like um, the CFR has a membership application. You could join the CFR if you wanted. You could fill out an application they have, and you could send it in to them, and they would, uh, they would look at it and scrutinize it, of course. You, you, you probably couldn't get in, but uh, maybe you could. But, you probably know, a lot not. of a lot of people get in, and, and it, it's an application. You, you're, you're welcome and free to apply, even if you get rejected. But there's 3,500 people, members of the CFR, that haven't gotten rejected, and there they are. They go to the meetings. They're free to go to the meetings. Some do, some don't. Um, but the Trilateral Commission has always selected its members with an executive board or an executive search committee, if you will. And in the early days, that included David Rockefeller and Brzezinski. They were both on it, and, and I think four or five other people. They would independently determine who they wanted to tap for membership. So it came from their cronies, for one. I mean, they had to somehow know these people a little bit about them somewhere to know that they wanted to tap them. But the process was much like a fraternity at college. 
And when you go to rush week, when you're a, a freshman, and you go, you know, you go to the to the, the pledge week or the rush week, they call it, where you go to parties, and you kind of hint, hint. I hope that I can get into such and such a fraternity or a sorority, but you can't go and ask. At least back when I went to college, you couldn't. <laughs> you had to wait for somebody to come up and tap you on the shoulder, and they would observe you at the party to see it. You know, they'd talk to you. They'd see, you know, if you got drunk, made a fool of yourself. I don't know what they did, but they would look for the cool people that they wanted to be part of their fraternity, and then they would come up and tap you on the shoulder and say, come with me. <laughs> and then you would go through a candidating process. You know, they take, we want you to be a member of our, our fraternity. That's the way these guys did. They went out and tapped people, uh, say, you know, hey, come over here. We want to talk to you about being a member of the Trilateral Commission. And that's how people got in, and that's how people get in today. Every member that belongs to this group was selected in this way. Unbelievable. You know, uh, Patrick Wood, I got to tell you, I got it wrong. I've gotten a couple of things wrong, and, and at least, uh, and maybe at most, I can say that when I get something wrong, I'll just say it, and then I'll readjust my position and then go forward from there. I really thought all of this was being conducted in furtherance of global communism, but I missed it. It's all in furtherance of global what, techism, scientism, I guess it is. <clears throat> a global technocracy f based on scientism. Mm -hmm. but let's take a little break and come back. And uh, I like what you're doing. Just, just let us all have it, me included. A little self-calibration is not always possible. Sometimes we need to be calibrated by others. We'll be right back. And in the, uh, in the meantime, be sure and take a look at Mr. Wood's website i was thinking again and and i thought you know i can understand why people who are economically or intellectually privileged shall we say could view the world as in, in a state of um well needing help chaos everywhere you look all these various conflicts that can be um e you know, easily put down with, with the use of force, but uh, wouldn't it be better to just shape the world in a certain way? So I'm not really playing devil's advocate, or well, maybe, actually, maybe I am, uh, except for this part. Absent the rejection of the almighty creator, what is it about this that is detrimental to the human being? I mean, is there any... I've often thought that the, that the 30s were just a golden age of all kinds of things, um, from aviation to uh, these various philosophies, you know, the New Age uh, or the New Thought movement uh, that uh, Neville Goddard was part of. And, but, uh, but he wasn't a, a technocrat. And, and I just wonder, somebody up there uh, certainly thinks that, I mean, I can't figure out if, if the reason these people hold this this philosophy and they really want and, and there's so much energy is put being put into this initiative i'm wondering if they if it's all about them or if they really feel that humanity at large will be happier under such a broad and totalitarian system that doesn't really sound much like uh, like devil's advocate but i'm just wondering what what is in their minds philosophically that makes this okay somehow unless they're luciferian uh, when it comes right down to it? You know, that, that's a good question. I think it could be argued both ways. <clears throat> On one hand, I've seen an attitude of just sheer greed. I've seen this attitude for 40 years. And it's not uncommon. I'm not surprised anymore when I see just a complete expression of greed. I want more. But <clears throat> on the other hand, in the writings of these academics and you know, other people around them, <clears throat> we've seen the fear that man is going to blow himself up one day and destroy the planet, just destroy everything. Yeah. There's this fear. And they believe that men are not able to self-regulate. Actually, Sigmund Freud had a lot to do with this, by the way, I think, with his whole idea of irrational desires 
you know, that people have hidden in their heart. And if we let those get out of control, oh my gosh, the human race is doomed. And so we have to control these things. We have to, you know, we have to get people lined up to where they won't do these things. And of course they failed at every turn. You know, people are still killing each other and and doing crazy things. Uh, So that wasn't a true answer, but I've seen this writing for decades where there's this, er, this almost irrational fear of society harming itself if they don't step in and do something. And you see, this kind of goes back to the, the thought that St. Simon had, that scientists and engineers are superior to all other men. <laughs> they need to say this. Yeah. You know, they need to be the Superman, if you will, to come in and, and it's their manifest destiny, if you will, you know, to help the human race not destroy itself by doing all these things. And so I see that as the legitimate, you know, thread that you can follow. But then there's people like Al Gore that come on the scene. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Al Gore is just, you know, he I don't know how much you of that of that line he believes, but I'll, I'll tell you what, the, the guy the guy is hungry for money and that's it. It's a scam he's promoting with this climate change, global warming stuff that we're all going to die when the oceans rise. And oh, by the way, my billions, I think he's the first green billionaire, actually, that's just that's become a billionaire just because of green stuff. And, you know, he's hyping this thing while he is living a virtually decadent lifestyle himself with no respect to, <laughs> to, living, to living green or sustainable himself. And yet he's telling us that we need to like, come on, Al, get, sure. get off of it. You're just a crook. You know, you just, you're just conning us. So, you know, you see both, both sides of the coin. That's all I can say. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. You know, I've often thought that the, uh, that the, uh, the thirties were just, uh, like I say, a golden era of, of so many things. Um, uh, even, even, uh, John Baird, I believe his name was a Scott, uh, developed a three dimensional color. A television picture in a in a in a giant glass vacuum tube at like 1937 or 38, and you know uh, Frank Whittle and then Ernst Heinkel with the jet engines and all this stuff and all this nuclear stuff that was coming along, and uh-huh. it's just it's really strange to look back in history and just marvel at how groups of of people, I mean like the Nazis for example, I mean they uh-huh. they uh, the the Germans took it pretty hard after uh, the Treaty of Versailles they got a lot of land property taken away and. Uh-huh. And they, they were permitted to have shotguns so they could hunt game, but that was about it. And they were mad, and they were, and they're, you know, they are geniuses. They, they are, I mean, literature, uh, music, uh, t- technology, uh-huh. all kinds of inventions, engineering, uh-huh. everything. Nobody can deny these people have something going on. And then you see this mad, this massive movement where it's like, ah, dimension und der Führer and all this stuff, and they're all together. And then it just turns into a great big cluster foxtrot that's just, murder everywhere you look and if you're not nazi enough well let's just take him out and shoot him get him out of here her too and and it, it's almost like these these grandiose ideas of a perfect society somehow just turn into pools of you know what it's just they just implode on themselves because they seem to just overreach to yeah. to, to the point that uh, that that they can't control themselves that I mean, the organization can't control themselves anymore so i mean is right. this why they want to say well we got a solution for that. We'll let the robot sort it out. Yeah. You know, I mean, is that where we're headed here? Is that, I mean, I was just seeing an article about yeah. how all these Google bots are going to take to the skies and Google Glass. You're going to be seeing a lot more of that. So, I mean, yeah. where does it all end or, or do we know? Yeah. This is uh, probably a good time to bring up the, the kind of a side point that I am not anti engineer or scientist in any way. Neither am I. I'm I, I just, you know, there are many, if not the majority, of people who study science. I don't care whether they have a, a, a degree, a master's degree, a PhD, that are good people, that think straight, that are good Americans or good citizens, whatever the country that they are, and they're not into technocracy. There are lots of them. Which is basically the subjugation of humanity through te- technology. That's right. So, you know, I don't want I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I personally I love technology. I've been a technologist all of my life. And you know, I 
when when technology serves me, I feel good. I love. I